The Jeep brand is of course synonymous around the globe with SUVs, but it has suffered here in the UK, partly due to a lack of models. But since it became part of the Fiat Chrysler Group, that's begun to change. And this is the latest one to arrive on our shores. It's the Compass. It revives a name last used on a small SUV in 2015. But Jeep would rather you forgot about that previous effort as it was pretty poor. The new Compass fills a hole in Jeep's range between the tiny Renegade and the mid-sized Cherokee and as such lines up to take on the Renault Cadger, Toyota CHR and the car buyer favourite, the Peugeot 3008. And I think they've done a pretty good job. I mean, here at the front you've got the traditional Jeep grille although a closer inspection reveals that the vents are actually blocked off. You've got a really nice, tall, ride height, chunky styling. It looks like a proper SUV, doesn't it? Um, and of course, this being a Jeep, it will take you off-road. There are four-wheel drive versions available, along with the two-wheel drive versions that SUV buyers traditionally are after. Sadly, once you get inside, it's a little bit of a letdown. It doesn't live up to the style that the exterior promises. It just looks quite old fashioned in here, if I'm honest. Um, and I'm not too sure about the quality either. Yeah, there are some soft touch plastics around the place, but just look at a few things like this. The stalks just wobble and feel like they might snap off at some point. And this center console, the build quality isn't the best on that either. When it comes to all important storage, you know, it's okay. Console back in there, it's an all right size. The door bins though are small. Glove box is average size, but because this is an American car, you do get fantastic size cup holders. Um, this chunky steering wheel does feel actually really nice when you're driving. And although most of the car's functions are controlled from this touchscreen infotainment system, it's nice to see some physical controls underneath there. Although I think the screen is in the wrong position, it's just too low for the driver's eye line and you find yourself having to look down to it when you're driving. I mean, for me, as I've said, the whole thing just feels a little bit old fashioned, lacking in flair, particularly if you compare it to something like the Peugeot 3008, which for very similar money just has so much more going for it. At launch, there are three simple trim levels. Sport kicks things off with 16-inch alloys, a 5-inch touchscreen with DAB and Bluetooth, keyless entry, cruise control and lane departure warning. Longitude is next and throws in a larger infotainment screen with sat-nav, dual-zone climate control, roof rails and 17-inch alloys. Whilst Limited adds a heated steering wheel, leather seats, automatic wipers, a parking camera, front and rear parking sensors, 18-inch alloys and it has the ability to park itself. A Trailhawk version will arrive later with some serious off-road handling, tow hooks and a rock mode for the low ratio gearbox. You know, I also have a few niggles just about the lack of thought that's gone into some things. For example, down here, I mean, this is just normally covered in so many cars, particularly in an SUV that's likely to get dirty and muddy. Um, it means that when you get into this, you sort of catch your leg on it all and your clothes get all dirty like that. There's also quite a high step to get over to get into the back. And when you add to that the fact that the doors don't open that wide, I think it could be a bit of a pain getting children in and out of the back of here. However, once you are in, things are pretty good space-wise. You've got a nice wide seat with a couple of Isofix child seat points, good headroom, and the driver's seat is set for a six-footer, which leaves, you know, leg room that you certainly can't complain about. Just like the space in the back seats, the boot is average for the class. There's a small loading lip, but generally it's usefully square and large enough for this type of car. There's a number of hooks, cubby holes and a power socket, but what's not so great is that the rear seats don't fold completely flat. Under the bonnet, you'll get a 1.4-litre turbo petrol with 138 brake horsepower, a six-speed manual gearbox and two-wheel drive, or a 167 brake horsepower version with a 9-speed auto and 4-wheel drive. There's a 118 brake horsepower 1.6-litre diesel with a manual box and 2-wheel drive, along with two different 2-litre diesels. Both 2-litre cars have 4-wheel drive, and cars driven by all four wheels have selectable drive modes. Trailhawk also gets a rock crawling mode. Now we've got the 2 litre here and it delivers a strong dose of power and should return in the early 50s MPG wise. So this manual gearbox though isn't the smoothest, the 9 speed automatic is definitely the better out of the two. 
And also I will say this two litre diesel is really quite noisy and a bit gruff. The 1.6 litre is definitely quieter and if you go for the 1.4 litre petrol you'll find even more refinement in that. The 1.6 is the best all-round choice for fuel economy too thanks to its smaller size and it only comes with two-wheel drive. Jeep claims around 62.4 miles to the gallon and 117 grams per kilometre of CO2. The petrol, on the other hand, returns 41 miles to the gallon and coughs out 160 grams per kilometre. Well, to drive, well, it's nothing to write home about, but then are any SUVs in this class? So few of them actually offer real driving enjoyment. But one thing I will say about it, though, is that it corners pretty well with very little body roll. The steering is just a little bit meatier than most small SUVs, no doubt helped by this really nice chunky steering wheel that I've already mentioned. If driving fun is really at the top of your list of priorities when you're choosing an SUV, then you need to go for something like the Seat Attica or the Peugeot 3008, both of which would be a far better bet than this. Jeep says it's put a special damping system on the compass that smooths out the potholes, but the fact is that it doesn't. You also get an awful lot of road noise coming back into the cabin on anything other than really flat roads. What else? Well, rear visibility actually isn't that good due to those fat pillars in the back and the rather slim rear window. And while it's great that there are these physical buttons down here on the dashboard, they're just too low down. You've got to take your eyes off the road to operate them. And the touchscreen, as I've said, isn't in the right position and it also isn't the most intuitive to use when you're on the move. There's no doubt that the Compass is in a different league compared to the old car. And if you go for the four-wheel drive version and intend to do some off-roading, then the Compass is probably one of, if not the best in class for tackling rugged terrain and giving you the confidence to do so. But overall, for the job that most SUV buyers want it to do, sadly the Compass just doesn't have enough going for it.